Hello, good evening. This is Pastor Brad Ingram, and uh, I'm uh, very pleased to have you joining us tonight. Um, if this is your first time joining us, uh, we have a weekly Bible study session here, and uh, for the past several weeks, I have been attempting to answer some of the questions that you have sent to me, and I really do appreciate your participation. Uh, just so you know, I serve as the pastor of Truth Baptist Church in West Salem, Ohio. If you live in our area, we invite you to come. I would be personally grateful to have you in church with us this Sunday. We're located at 12457 North Illyria Road. That's uh, State Route 301. For those of you who know the area, our Sunday school is at 930. Our morning worship is at 10.30. Our Sunday evening service is at 6. And then our Wednesday evening service is at 7. I would like to encourage you to look at our website. Um, many, many series I have taught and lessons I have brought are available on our website. Uh, chances are that an issue that you may have questions about has already been covered. There's something like 100 to 200 lessons that I have um, given that you can view and listen to on our website. There's also commentaries I've written, and uh, everything there is free of charge. Just visit, download what you like. I appreciate these names I see coming up on the screen. Um, I appreciate you folks. It's a real encouragement to have you here. And uh, to our church members, I see a few of you here. Uh, you have to listen to me every week, and it's a blessing that you've tuned in tonight as well. Um, I appreciate Brother Qualls, uh, Brother Lonnie Qualls. I love this dear man. I appreciate him and my parents, Sister Linda, uh, Mary Ann, um, Hayes, Miss Vanessa, Holbrook. I just appreciate you folks. And uh, April Callaway, I used to pastor that dear lady in Tennessee. And uh, my Aunt Lisa's here. I better stop calling names off or I'm going to miss some folks and uh, they're going to think it's personal. But I appreciate all you folks listening. It means a lot that you're here. So if you don't have a home church and you live in our area, please come by and see us. Or visit our website at tbcwestsalem.com, tbcwestsalem.com, and you'll find so much more information about things perhaps that you've been interested in. But tonight I want to uh, sort of launch out into the deep with a question that really is a follow-up question to what we looked at last week. I encourage you to go back on my page here on Facebook and look at the archived lesson from last Thursday night. Last Thursday evening, we covered aspects of the millennium. Now, when we say the millennium, we're talking about that future period of 1,000 years during which Jesus Christ will rule on this earth visibly, physically, literally, with his headquarters being in the city of Jerusalem. And uh, just very briefly, for those who couldn't be here last week, during the millennium, the earth will be remade, if you want to say it that way. During the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, everything that God intended for this earth to be will be. Of course, the devil and man's cooperation temporarily thwarted God's plan. You cannot overthrow God's plan. So during the millennium, the Edenic curse will be lifted. I won't go back over all this because we're going to need some time tonight for this next question I've been asked. But just briefly, during the millennial period, God's going to restore the earth to a garden-like state as it was in Eden. Uh, God will cause the deserts to bloom uh, as a garden. God will uh, remove the curse from the animals. There will be no more hostility between men and animals. Everything as it was in Eden will return. Men will live uh, very long lives into the hundreds of years. Sickness will be something of the past. And so it's going to be a tremendous time. Now the question that I was not able to cover last week deals with the bodies of the saints. What bodies will we be in through all of eternity? On the heel of that question, I was also sent a question this week asking me about what knowledge we will have, not only in the millennium, but in heaven as well. 
through eternity, what will we look like? What will we? What will be our personality? Will we recognize one another? And if you have lost loved ones, if you have a saved family member or friend, those questions have undoubtedly come to your mind. And I'm probably talking to folks now that you've lost loved ones and you're wondering, or you have wondered, can they see me? What can they see about activities on this earth? What kind of bodies do they have? What will I be like in eternity? This is a very valid inquiry. It is your eternity and my eternity if we know the Lord is our Savior. So I've got several scriptures for you tonight. I'd like to first begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you're a Bible reader, you'll know that this is probably the most significant chapter in the entire Word of God dealing with the resurrection and uh, how important it is, not just our Lord's resurrection. And let me say here, you cannot, you will not ever see heaven unless you believe in the bodily, literal, physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot go to heaven trusting a dead Savior. And I'm pretty sure I'm preaching to the choir on that point. But the skeptics would have you believe something else. But nobody goes to heaven without a belief in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you have a Bible, I know some of you don't, uh, I'll read through these. I appreciate uh, see my brother here joining us. I appreciate you, brother, some of my family. But let's get on to the reading here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, notice carefully, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on Im incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Notice carefully these next verses. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's resurrection, brethren. Those are promises made to believers. Do you see those questions here? Notice the question. There are two questions in verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Those apply to the two groups of believers when the Lord Jesus comes at the rapture of the church. If you... Uh, have not died and you are alive and remain at the rapture you'll be instantly changed and as you look back to this earth as if there'd be time if you could look back at this earth as we're being carried out of this plane you could look back to this earth and say oh death where is thy sting it never got you you see but for the other group of believers who have died in faith as their bodies are resurrected and as they are taken out of this world, they'll be able to look back at the empty grave that used to hold them and they'll be able to ask the question, Grave, where is thy victory? Two questions. And each of those questions correspond to a believer at the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're alive and remain, you'll be able to say, O oh, death, where is thy sting? If you've, uh, those who have died in Christ and their bodies are in the ground, at the rapture, they'll be able to say, O oh, grave, where is thy victory? I'm thinking about loved ones that I've lost. I'm thinking about, uh, we really shouldn't use the word lost. If, if a loved one uh, is died in faith and they are a believer in Jesus Christ, we haven't lost anybody. Something that's lost implies that we don't know where it is. But I'm thinking about those who have departed this life that I've loved and my family, members of my family, members of the two churches that I've had the pastor, the privilege of pastoring. I've buried these folks, but I can say that those that I have had to bury in the ground at the rapture, they're going to be able to say, O oh, grave, where is thy victory? If the Lord were to come tonight in the rapture, and I haven't died, I'm still here, I'd be able to say, Death, where is thy sting? Beautiful questions, and both of them will be answered at the moment of the rapture. Now, back to the hand, the subject at hand tonight. Again, the question is, what bodies will we have in eternity? 
and what will we know in heaven? What knowledge will we have? What do those in heaven now? Can they see us? A lot of speculation in these areas here. And I want to say to you kindly, but firmly, you better use great caution whenever you read a book or watch a movie or read uh, a, uh, or view a documentary of anyone who has what could be called an after-death experience or a vision of heaven. I am not indicting these people and I am not saying that they are frauds. What I'm saying is take what you see in here and line it up next to God's Word. And if it does not correspond to what God's Word says, you can dismiss that testimony as either being a delusion or an outright fraud. Again, I'm not saying that in a mean spirit. I'm just saying take these things, uh, these testimonies, these books that have been written, uh, purporting that someone has gone to heaven and come back. When you see those things, line them up with the Bible, and if it does not square with Scripture, I trust you know where the error is to be found. It's not to be found with the Bible. So we're going to come to this issue using the Bible alone. I'm not going to be quoting for you any testimony of anyone who has had one of these experiences. I'm not going to quote that any time during this study. I'm going to be giving you God's Word only on the issue, and I have several scriptures. Uh, truthfully, I don't believe we'll be able to get through this question tonight. We'll probably, Lord willing, have to continue this next week. But let's just jump in now, and if you have your Bibles handy... Look at these passages with me. Check it out. Be as the Bereans. They search the scriptures themselves. So again, some of you are just joining us. The question that we're going to answer tonight, or rather let the Bible answer, number one, what kind of bodies will we have in heaven? What will we know in heaven? Will we know our husbands, our wives, our children? And then finally, can the folks who are in heaven now, what can they see about life on this earth. Can they see us? Can they watch us? So we can appeal to the scripture. We have no higher authority. But I give you that word of caution again. Anytime you hear a testimony or read a book or watch a movie about this thing, line it up with scripture. We ought to take care, and I give you this, uh, th these verses sort of to get the foundation. There was one experience, an after-death experience, that you can absolutely trust with all of your heart. And that experience was recorded in the Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Listen as I read to you, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth how that he was called up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. You see what just happened there? We read of a man who had a genuine, bona fide, after-death experience where he went to heaven. The Bible referred to it as the third heaven. Incidentally, the Bible only makes an allowance for three heavens. Uh, not seven heavens, as uh, the Islamists teach. The Bible knows nothing about that. The Bible just gives us three heavens. The third heaven seeming to be God's abode. So you have the Apostle Paul. He is uh, stoned at Lystra and left for dead. And I believe he did die. I believe Paul was stoned to death there. And I believe he went. his uh, soul and spirit went to the third heaven and saw something up there. And uh, when he came back to this earth, if you read that part of your Bible in the book of Acts, when Paul was revived and came to, instead of running away from that city as fast as he could, he went back into the city. And I believe with all my heart, brethren, I believe he wanted to see if they had stoned him again so he could get back to heaven. But you see, it wasn't God's time for him. So God let Paul come back, and Paul was not able to give testimony of what he saw in the third heaven. I say that for this reason. If God didn't allow the Apostle Paul to give us very many details of what the third heaven is like, 
then uh, you better examine and you better judge righteously anyone else who claims to have such a revelation. Again, I'm not charging these folks with any, any fraud or any... Now, there have been cases where later the testimony came out that it was a fraud. But I'm not going to make that blanket statement. I'm just saying uh, examine the thing by Scripture. And if it doesn't line up with Scripture, of course, throw it out the door. Uh, it's good to see some of you folks who are just joining us. I appreciate you being here. The question tonight is, what will we know in heaven? Uh, what will our bodies be like in heaven? So that's the warning. Be careful. Be wary. Uh, of course, there was another instance where a man asked God, asked Abraham uh, to send Lazarus back from the dead to be a witness to these five brethren, and God wouldn't let Lazarus go back. Uh, so be careful again. God has, remember, in God's word, he wants us to live by faith and not by sight. I have never had an out-of-body experience. I have never been caught up to the third heaven, but I believe it's there. I believe it just as if I had seen it because I believe the Bible. And remember, the Lord pronounced a blessing when he said in John 20:29. 20, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Now, let's jump right into it. If you have your Bible, the first thing I want to show you from the Scripture on this issue of heaven is uh, uh, simply this. Christ must be our point of reference when it comes to studying our glorified bodies. I have uh, some dear friends down there in Knoxville, and they said that they've been pondering lately what their bodies will be like in heaven. And, of course, the answer can be found in Scripture, but the key to answering that question is what kind of body did Jesus Christ have after his resurrection? You see, you must study the Lord Jesus after he rose from the dead because if you can find out what his body looked like, That'll answer the question of what kind of body you're going to have in eternity. Now, my basis for saying this is found in 1 John chapter 3. Maybe you'd like to turn there. 1 John chapter 3. Notice the Bible says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Did you catch that? That's First John chapter 3. The Bible said, It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. What the Bible teaches here clearly is that when the Lord comes for us at the rapture, when we see the Lord instantly, instantaneously, we will be made just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brother, that's a promise. That's a promise you can uh, hang your hat on, as they used to say. That's a glorious promise. You're going to be made into the image of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 8, the Bible is clear when it says that God has predestined believers to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the question, what kind of body did our Savior have after his resurrection? And again, that is important because the kind of body you're going to have in eternity, and I say these things again, I hope you don't feel like I'm being repetitive, but uh, repetition is a mother of learning, and I want you to get it. If you're wondering what your body is going to be like after you receive a glorified body, look to Jesus. His body is the key. First of all, notice this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. The Apostle Paul says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. That's the first thing you need to see about this. The body of Jesus Christ after his resurrection was a body of flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. That's something that you need to get a hold of because we just read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 
So I can say to you dogmatically, authoritatively, that in eternity, if you're a believer, if you trusted Christ as your Savior, your glorified body will be a body of literal flesh and bone, but it will not be flesh and blood. You will have a bloodless body in eternity. I say that on the authority that the body of our Savior was bloodless after his resurrection. You see, he shed his blood during his death. He shed his blood. He gave his life. The blood was presented to God the Father. That's the atonement. And so every time you see our Savior showing up after his resurrection, he came in a literal body of flesh and bone. But I have more scripture to ver validate this. Listen to Luke 24, verse 39 and 40. Luke 24, 39 through 40, Jesus said after his resurrection, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, listen, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Did you catch that? The disciples saw the Lord, and their first reaction was, He must be a ghost. He must be a spirit. And they were frightened, obviously. But He comes to them and says, and that was Luke 24, 39, He said, A spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. So our Lord, um, without any, any controversy, made the definitive statement on the glorified body when he said the glorified body has flesh and bones but notice he didn't say a word about blood he simply said a spirit hath not flesh and bones there's another reason we know that the Lord's body after his resurrection was a bloodless body in John chapter 20 verse 27 do you remember Thomas when we refer to him as doubting Thomas he came to the Lord and Thomas had previously made a statement that unless I can touch the nail prints and the wounds, I will not believe. So the Lord held him to his word. And in John 20, verse 27, the Bible says, Then he, Jesus, saith to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it, notice, into my side. Now, that would have been impossible had the Lord had blood. Because the Lord said, take your hand and thrust it into my side. That's the scripture. That's John 20, verse 27. This could not have been done with a body full of blood. But it could have been very easily done with a body of flesh and bone. You see, the Lord had his flesh. And there was that indention, that hole, that piercing in his side and so it would have been very easy for Thomas to simply take his hand and thrust it into the body of our Lord. But you don't do that with a blood-filled body. And of course, that's another evidence to the fact that the Lord had a flesh and bone body, not flesh and blood. Now you may say, that seems to be sort of an insignificant point. Well, it may seem that way to you. But you have to remember, in the book of Leviticus, the Bible teaches that the life of the flesh is in the blood. What keeps you alive is your blood. But here's the bad news. Your blood is corrupted. My blood is corrupted. We were all born of Adam's fallen race. And so you see, uh, my blood is going to get me nothing but a grave and a hospital bed and uh, doctor's visits and whatever else. But you see, in eternity, the life of the flesh is not going to be my blood. In eternity, I'll have flesh and bone, but my life will be the Spirit of God. He will be that life-giving presence, the, the person of the Holy Spirit. And so I'll never be bothered with blood in eternity, neither was Christ. So let's get that down, then we'll move on. If you want to know what your body is going to be like in heaven in eternity, when you receive your glorified body, it will be a body of flesh and blood, but not or a body of flesh and bone. You will not have a body of flesh and blood. Uh, once we post this, go back and listen to that last 10 minutes. I gave you the references there. But uh, some of you just now coming in. So the first thing about your glorified body is that it will be a body of flesh and bone. I must make this statement now. 
no believer from the church age has a glorified body yet. If your mother or your father has gone on to be with the Lord, uh, they do not yet have that glorified body. What In their case, the spirit and soul have gone to be with the Lord. But the body of the believer is yet in the ground or wherever that body was buried. So get that straight. No believer in the church age, no born-again child of God in this dispensation has received their glorified body. The only one in heaven who has a glorified body is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. So your loved ones who have gone to heaven, they're waiting to receive their body. Their bodies are in the ground. Dust has gone back to dust, and ashes have gone back to ashes. But at the rapture, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and of course, those bodies that will come forth from that tomb will be bodies of flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. Here's something else about the body that you're going to have after it's been glorified. It will not be constrained by distance or by solid objects. Now this almost sounds like something out of a science fiction magazine, but again, you have to go back to the pattern, and the pattern is our Savior. What kind of body did he have after his resurrection? All right, listen to as I read from John chapter 20, verse 19. John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Here they were, the doors were closed. They had that room locked up tighter than a bank vault because the disciples were still yet uh, terrified. They were fearful because the Lord had been crucified and they didn't know but what they may be the next ones to go, to be hung. And the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and I love the Bible and how detailed and specific it is, the Holy Spirit took care to tell us that the doors were shut where the disciples were. And who came and who stood in the midst? It was the Lord not in his body of flesh and blood, but he came to him in that glorified body of flesh and bone. So your body in eternity will not be hindered by solid objects. It'll be as if you can pass right through the solid objects. That's not the only case that verifies this. You remember when Peter and John came to the tomb of our Lord and uh, Peter stooped and looked in and John saw something when John looked in. He saw the grave clothes where they lay and they had retained their form and they had retained the shape of a body. The only thing that had been disturbed was that napkin that had been about the Lord's face. It had been taken apart and folded up and put in a place separately. But the picture here, the Bible says as soon as John saw the grave clothes, he ran in, he knew the Lord had been resurrected. Well, what about those grave clothes would say there's been a resurrection? Why couldn't his body have been stolen away and the grave clothes been simply left behind? No, you see, John saw a miracle. John saw those grave clothes had retained their shape as if a body was still there. Can you explain that? Uh, yes, I can. Jesus, after the three days had been accomplished, he simply sat up and his body passed right through the wrappings and where they had become uh, hardened because of the preserving spices, they retained their shape. The Lord did not have to unwrap himself or cut, uh, cut the wrappings away from him. He simply uh, sat up, come forth. Now that's power. And so we see the Lord's resurrection body uh, without blood, and it was not hindered by solid objects. That sounds pretty interesting. Uh, if you want to have a body like that, friend, don't miss heaven. If you want to get in on that, don't miss heaven. That's the kind of body you're going to have if you're a believer. Something else about the Lord's body, and uh, therefore your body, when it's glorified, is that it will not be constrained by distance. In John 20, verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. Jesus said to Mary, Don't touch me, I have not yet made the trip to the third heaven to my Father. 
But if you read that chapter in chapter 20 of John, in the very same chapter, you see Jesus back on the earth and he's inviting his disciples to touch him, to uh, thrust Thomas, as it were, thrust his hand into her, his side. So what you have in just a matter of a few hours, you have Jesus Christ leaving this earth, going to the third heaven, and coming back. Now, brother, uh, NASA doesn't have a clue on where the third heaven is. It's a trip you couldn't make by a rocket. But see, the Lord didn't have any trouble. He was there and back in just the space of a few short hours. So his body was not limited to time or space. Now, I hope that answers a question somewhat uh, concerning the type of body you'll have in eternity. If you're born again child of God, your resurrected body will be flesh and blood, uh, bone. You won't be a spirit or a ghost there. You won't be some apparition that's sort of just floating around eternally in heaven with other spirit manifestations. Uh, there'll be literal, physical, flesh and bone that you can touch, that you can handle, that you can communicate with, because that's the body our Lord had after his resurrection. And as we started off, 1 John 3, we shall be like him. So to sum it up on that point, you're going to be just like Jesus Christ in eternity. Your body, your body will be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I hope that brings a measure of comfort. Some folks seem to have the idea that when we get to heaven, we won't be inter able to interact with our loved ones uh, as we are now to come up and hug each other or fall upon each other's neck and kiss each other. That's not the way it is, folks. You'll have a body of flesh and bone, not flesh and blood. Now, uh, just we'll take just a couple more minutes because I want to look at another aspect of that question, what will we do in heaven and what will we know in heaven? If you're a child of God, this should be of utmost importance to you because this is your eternity. And especially some of you folks who have believers already going on to be with the Lord, um, it should interest you, what can they see, what do they know? So just very quickly, and uh, we'll finish this God willing next week, what about heaven? What does the Bible say? What does the scripture say will be our lot? What will we do? What will be our responsibility in heaven? Well, first of all, uh, in heaven, you'll have perfect, unhindered knowledge. You see here, sin clouds everything. Sin has blown out the lamp of reason. Uh, it has uh, darkened our minds. The book of Romans talks about our understanding being darkened. I don't believe for a moment that there were such a thing as cavemen, uh, these sort of brute beasts. I don't believe for a moment that men have gradually gotten smarter. I believe we've gotten dumber. I believe with all my heart that Adam, the first man, was the pinnacle of creation. I believe he was the intellectual genius. I mean, could you name all the animals? Could you do it? Adam did it. Uh, but you see, what's happened is we have, we've gotten... Um, more intellect, perhaps, as far as the world defines intellect. Yes, we made some strides technologically, but as far as wisdom goes, folks, we've come a long way in the wrong direction. And so, in heaven, you'll have perfect knowledge unhindered by the element of sin. It won't be clouding your vision. I've heard some folks say, when I get to heaven, I've got a lot of questions for the Lord. I question that. I really do. You'll have perfect knowledge. Uh, the Apostle Paul said that now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, I believe that in heaven we'll have perfect knowledge of God's will, and uh, we won't have a long list of questions, and we're not going to demand of God anything. Uh, we'll have perfect and unhindered knowledge. Again, we'll be like him. Now, let me answer this first part of the question, and then we'll finish up here for tonight. Will our loved ones be recognized in heaven? Now, maybe that's crossed your mind. Honestly, I have surveyed some of the testimonies that have been given by these folks who have allegedly had afterlife experiences. 
I read one account where the person said they had died and gone to heaven and uh, everybody was an angel. Everybody had wings, everybody uh, had a halo and uh, they just were indistinguishable. Everybody was an angel. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. Uh, don't, don't make the mistake for a moment in thinking that humans turn into angels when they die. God made a certain number of angels. He created a certain number of angels, a fixed number, and uh, you don't turn into angels no more than angels turn into men. Uh, you see, God never provided salvation for the angels that sinned, uh, as the Bible tells us. So everybody in heaven doesn't turn into this angelic being. I uh, hope that doesn't shatter your your preconceived idea about heaven, but it's not going to be angels here floating around for eternity on a cloud playing a harp eating cream cheese. You know, that was the old commercial several years ago. But the question is, what will we know in heaven? Will our loved ones recognize us? Well, if you have a Bible, turn to Second Samuel chapter 12. In Second Samuel chapter 12, King David uh, had just received word that his infant son had died. Uh, for the sake of time, I won't give you the entire account, but because of the adulterous relationship between David and Bathsheba, God took their infant child in death. And uh, here's what the Bible says concerning David after he had received news that baby had died. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 21, Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? I can, uh, can I bring him back? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. I hope you've caught the importance of David's statement. David did not say, I shall go to where he is. David said, I shall go to him. Notice the wording. David did not simply say, the child is with the Lord and I'll go to where the child is. David said, I shall go to him. He's talking about going to a person that he could identify. And so our loved ones in heaven, they will retain their identity. I can give you more proof of this. You remember on the Mount of Transfiguration when two Old Testament characters appeared up there on the mountain with Jesus and both of those Old Testament characters, although they had died, were recognizable in the type of bodies they had because Peter and James and John instinctively knew that that was Elijah and Moses up there talking with Jesus Christ. No one had to tell Peter and James and John who those men were. Peter said, let us build three tabernacles here, Lord, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So we will know our loved ones in heaven. I'll confess to you here, there's still a lot about that that is mysterious that I haven't found the answer to. Um, there were some folks who came to the Lord in the New Testament and they asked about marriage. And uh, they put forth this hypothetical situation that you'll find in uh, Matthew chapter 22 and in Luke chapter 20. And I encourage you to read those sometime. Um, but what God's saying is in heaven there will be no marriages taking place. You see, there'll be no marriages being performed in heaven because there'll be one great marriage in heaven. That's the marriage of the bride of Christ, the church, to our heavenly husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you were to ask me, will I know my spouse in heaven? Will I know my children? Uh, the Bible teaches that uh, we will know, even as we're known. Can you imagine heaven being any less uh, of a wonderful place than this earth was? If we enjoy this relationship here, how much more will it be in heaven? Now again, I must say there, there's much about that still that's mysterious to me. I don't know of any scripture. I don't know of any preacher I've ever heard can fully exhaust that subject as to 
to what extent will we keep those relationships? You got to understand in heaven it won't be a situation where there are husbands and wives all over the place. In heaven, there is one bride, and that's all the redeemed together. And there's one husband, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But Scripture does teach that we'll know our loved ones in heaven. And, of course, I urge you to read more about that in Matthew 22 and Luke chapter 20. I just don't have the time to continue that here, but I want to leave you one more Scripture reference about this business of being able to recognize your loved ones. In Matthew chapter 22, listen to what our Lord said. In Matthew 22, verse 31, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Do you see this? Do you see this? What the Bible just told you is that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob keep their identity even in eternity. Because the Lord didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob while they were alive. God's words said, I am, present tense, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So those men still had their identities. They still had their personalities. In fact, God even referred to them by the very same names they had on earth, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so um, don't believe this, this idea that everybody takes on an angelic form in heaven. Uh, you, re you retain your identity. That's what the Lord teaches here. And uh, those relationships will be restored. And those relationships, friends, will be even greater and even more full than what they could ever be here on earth because you see on earth as much as you love someone perhaps your spouse or one of your children um, maybe some of you ladies i'm talking to and 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 the fathers too maybe you've lost maybe you've lost babies you miscarried or something along that nature um, that child is in heaven and as david said you will go not to where that child was, but to that you'll go to that child. And again, that's a precious promise. And uh, the love and the relationship that we'll experience in heaven will be even more magnificent than we ever could experience it here, as much as you mothers love your children. And I'm thinking of a dear lady now who um, I uh, served as her, of her pastor in Tennessee. And uh, she lost two precious boys um, at young ages. Uh, those boys are with the Lord. And she'll see those boys again. And they will not be unrecognizable to her. And as much as she loved those boys and their father too, I mean their father as well. I'm not taking anything away from the father. They both love their children. Uh, but as much as they loved them here, uh, they loved them with as pure love as we can experience. But see, we're not pure people. We're not, we're not perfect people. But in heaven, that love's going to be perfect. And uh, that's your future. If you're a child of God, that's your future. Now, we've just about come uh, to the 45-minute mark, I suppose, somewhere around there. And um, I found that it's better. They told us in school it's better to keep your audience longing than loathing so i think we're going to cut it off here uh, if you have any more questions uh, send them to me now next week what i think we'll do is i'll actually ask you to type in the questions on the spot up till now i've been looking at the questions you've sent me but i think next week maybe some of you listening i just i just had the thought that perhaps i'm saying something that you may have a question on right then so maybe next week we'll go to that format well i'll try to uh, if you have a question that comes up during the study, you can go ahead and just post that immediately. Uh, I'm, I'm not very good. I don't know if I'll be very good at shooting from the hip uh, because I certainly have much to learn, much to explore in God's Word. But um, it's a blessing to be able to minister to folks like you. Here it is a Thursday evening, and you're sitting at your computer or your phone or wherever, and you're listening to someone who is uh, not exceptional at all, Certainly not anything to look at, but you're just listening to God's Word. 
And that's a testimony, folks, of your spiritual condition. You love the Lord and you love his word. And I can report to all of you brothers and sisters in the faith who are listening, someday we're going to all be together with the Lord and with the saints. And if you're listening in on this and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you won't be in that number with us. We want you to be with us. We want you to go with us. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you must accept that you're a sinner by birth and by practice. And your sin has separated you from a holy God. And your sin deserves eternal separation in hell. But Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, gave himself, shed his blood, take your place on that center cross, on that middle cross, and if you'll call on him for salvation, turn to him, turn from your sin and turn to him, he'll save you. And this wonderful heaven we've been talking about tonight, that'll be your future. That'll be your eternity. So in summarization here, if you want to know what kind of body you're going to have in eternity, study the body of Jesus Christ. And maybe you'll study that yourself and God will give you something that I didn't see. Maybe I missed something myself. If that's the case, share it with me. But uh, certainly watch the first of this message again to get those references. And uh, study the issue. And I'll tell you this, I can say this with all authority in my heart. Uh, for a Christian, this book says that your best days are ahead of you. Don't ever let the devil tell you your best days are behind you. For a Christian, your best days are ahead. Eternity is in view. And those who have gone on before you, on to be with the Lord, they're safe with him. Don't worry about them. Don't spend, don't spend one moment of your time uh, in anguish over their well-being. We mourn for ourselves. I understand that. But your loved ones who are with the Lord, don't you worry about them. Their soul and their spirit are safe with Jesus Christ. Their body is down there in the ground, but they're not there. And someday that body is going to come out, be reunited with that spirit and that soul, and will be forever with the Lord, made in his perfect likeness and perfect image. Now, brethren, I don't know anybody can make you that good of a promise. I don't know if anybody can give you that kind of guarantee. But I guarantee it on the authority of God's Word. I appreciate you for listening. Next week, God willing, I'm going to try to answer the question, can our loved ones see us? Can they see what we're doing? How much of what we're doing on earth do they see? Do they know? And then I'm going to be answering the question, will we have responsibilities in heaven? What will we be doing for eternity? As a young child, I confess, I used to wonder, what could you possibly do forever and ever and ever? I mean, in it. Anything I, I used to think could get boring after an eternity. But uh, as the Lord's opened up some of his word here to me in this area, it's an exciting thing. So God willing, next Thursday night, if we're still here, uh, I'm going to try to answer the question or let the Bible answer the question. Can our loved ones in heaven see us? And what will we be doing? What will our activity be in eternity? And I hope you can be with us next week.